Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Rowena Ichon, Senior Vice President, and with me is Tim Anaya, Senior Director of Communications. So Tim, bills are are moving through the legislature, mostly bad ones, unfortunately, and the worst one of all, uh, single payer. Uh, How about filling us in on that? It's been a a, a fight we've been uh, anticipating for some time now, but the um, single payer bill that has been introduced this year, it's AB 1400 by Assemblyman Ash Collar of San Jose, and it is uh, similar to the uh, measure that was uh, introduced in prior sessions, um, but they are pushing forward with a vote on this measure before um, the January 31st deadline for bills to pass their house of origin. And there are, like with the other bill, there are a lot of concerns with the bill, a lot of unanswered questions. And now it's become really a political fight. You had the chair of the Progressive Caucus of the California Democratic Party threaten Democrats and said, if you do not vote for AB 1400, we are going to pull your endorsement for re-election. Well, now that is, uh, you're seeing Democratic members who might normally be no votes. Now they're suddenly looking over their left shoulders. So we will see what happens in the vote. Um, I predict you may have a lot more yes votes for that bill than you would normally because the bill has been double joined to the funding bill, which is ACA 11. And that is a $163 billion tax increase. So if both have to pass for it to take effect. If only one passes, it doesn't take effect. And so you may have some Democrats thinking, you know what, this is kind of a symbolic vote now. I could vote yes on the AB 1400, the policy, but I know that it's never going to happen because there's no way that the tax bill will get a two-thirds vote. And certainly there's no way Californians would vote for that bill. So we'll see, but it's becoming a nasty internal Democratic food fight. And we'll know by the end of the day today who wins. So, Ted, clear this up for me on the the spending part of the constitutional amendment. So if that makes it out of the legislature, both houses, does Newsom need to sign it in order to go forward on the ballot? No, assembly constitutional amendments do not require a governor's signature. Uh So if it gets two thirds of both houses, it goes on the ballot. Now, there are deadlines for that. I believe it's June 30th to appear on the November 2022 ballot. Um, If they don't care about 2022, you know, then they would just have to pass it in both houses on a two thirds vote by the end of session at the end of August. ACAs do not require a governor's signature. Hmm, That's interesting. Another bill that's moving through the the legislature, which uh, PRI fellow Carrie Jackson has written about is AB 257. And that's the Fast Food Accountability and Standards Recovery Act or Fast Recovery Act. And that has to do with trying to essentially take over labor standards in the fast food industry. So there will be a a government 11 member commission that would be a created, and they would be uh, tasked with uh, setting standards on wages and working conditions and training and so forth. Uh, Where do you think this is going to go? Well, it's kind of one of the last big battles of unionization. You know, I I don't think any of these fast food restaurants are unionized that I that I know of. And it's kind of a weird area because most fast food restaurants are franchised. I would be very surprised if that bill um, doesn't pass. Um, you know, whenever there's a big effort that's a big priority for unions, um, this union-dominated legislature usually passes it. However, the California Restaurant Association has been very strong in combating this uh, proposal. So who knows? But I feel like I would be surprised if any union priority doesn't pass. Uh, do you think Newsom will sign this bill? If I don't passes? know. I, I, I think he would be sympathetic toward it. I, I don't know if the franchisees have written him big checks that usually determines where he stands on an issue. So um, they're not the French laundry. So who knows? You might not think as kindly of McDonald's. Yeah, you know, I always say this as a former restaurateur, you'd think that he'd be a little bit more sympathetic to um, the business side of these issues. Well, it is an election year, so that uh, usually uh, 
union votes and union volunteers and union money will probably carry the day this year. So also lots of things happening in Washington, especially as they relate to California. As of this recording on Monday, we're still waiting the decision by the Supreme Court on whether they'll hear Prop 12. And that's the case for listeners. Prop 12 set the standards for the size of pens of, of farm animals, especially pork, which is a big case here because California is the largest consumer of pork products, but only has a very, very tiny pork production industry in the state. So essentially pork producers are arguing that uh, California is setting the standards for the entire country, uh, possibly violating the interstate commerce clause. So we're waiting on that, whether the Supreme Court is going to hear it. There's also a new wrinkle to that that came out about a week or so ago. The Superior Court of Sacramento County in California halted the enforcement of of Prop 12 because the uh, California Department of Agriculture took more than two years to, to finalize the regulations. So they're going to delay enforcement for about 180 days. So we still can buy bacon. Rush right out and get it while you can. <laughs> That's right. So finally, I'm watching Biden's new nomination to the Supreme Court. Uh, he made it a campaign promise to nominate a Black female. And in California, we have someone on the short list, uh, Justice Yandra Kruger of the California Supreme Court. And she actually grew up in South Pasadena, Tim. I looked that up. Uh, went to Harvard and Yale, also a, a law professor. And, you know, the, the legal eagles I know say that she's very smart, thoughtful, analytical, not an ideologue. So I'm kind of rooting for her you know, the hometown, home state justice, Tim. Yeah, she was appointed by a former governor, Jerry Brown, in his second stint as governor. And like a lot of things in his second term, he was quite different from first term. Remember, he infamously appointed Rose Byrd as chief justice of the Supreme Court and all of those um, Supreme Court justices who were recalled in 1986. Brown got the chance to appoint three or four. I don't remember how many, but um, he basically got to remake the California Supreme Court. And interestingly, the people that he uh, uh, nominated to the bench were kind of like Justice Kruger, smart, very well educated, certainly to the left, more academic type justices. And you can agree or disagree with their judicial philosophy, but every one of his nominees were certainly eminently well qualified to be on the court. Looking at who is being discussed to fill the Supreme Court vacancy, she certainly seems like someone who is worthy of serious consideration by President Biden. So in this podcast, our guest is Pam Lewison, director of the Agriculture Initiative at the Washington Policy Center. And uh, the Washington Policy Center, WPC, is Washington State. It's a free market policy think tank. Uh, we're so lucky to have Pam. And actually, she's agreed to also become a PRI fellow. So she'll be writing about ag issues in California and in the West and even nationally. In addition to uh, writing about ag policy, Pam is a, a farmer in Washington state. I think an alfalfa farmer. Is that right, Tim? That's right. That's right. And it's really an interesting discussion on kind of all these issues that we've been talking about. We get into Prop 12 and the pork issue uh, and some of these other um, big key issues that are facing um, agriculture, not only in California, but across the West. So uh, if you're interested in farming and ag issues, I think you'll find this interest, this interview very interesting. And for a commercial, uh, Tim, how about talking about the Sacramento conference on, on, on the 17th, February 17th? I can't believe it's almost February, but our fourth annual California Ideas in Action conference is going to be on Thursday, February 17th at the Hyatt Regency here in Sacramento across the street from the Capitol. And I'm so pleased we can actually be in person again, unlike last year. And um, it's very interesting uh, lineup this year. We have um, past next round podcast guest, Sacramento District Attorney Anne-Marie Schubert is our keynote speaker. And then we have um, some great panel discussions in the afternoon, including the unveiling of PRI's latest major research project on the California Environmental Quality Act, or as we're calling it, the sequel gauntlet. We're also going to talk about California's out-migration problem. And then uh, all of the issues uh, related to what seems to be a terrible trend of these destructive wildfires that we're having each year, wildfire policy, power blackouts, uh, water. What, what should Sacramento be doing differently to um, 
reduce the frequency and severity of these uh, wildfires and protect the residents in our way of life in, in rural California. So we'd love to have you in person. Thanks to our supporters. It's uh, individual registration is complimentary. So just go to pacificresearch.org slash events to register. And we hope to see you there. Now, Ro, you have an interesting lunch coming up in San Francisco. Yeah, that's right. So on the prior day, on February 16th, we have a luncheon with Michael Schellenberger, who wrote the great book, San Francisco. And we'd love to see you at the luncheon. Um, it'll be at the Omni Hotel. So if you're interested in that, you can check out the and register at our website, pacificresearch.org. And that book, San Francisco, is terrific. And he cites uh, our Carrie Jack. Jackson and Wayne Weingarten in our recent No Way Home book and his book. So uh, all the more reason to go see him uh, in person and check out his book. That's right. And you can buy his book uh, at the luncheon and he'll be signing books. Thanks everyone for listening. Welcome to PRI's Next Round Podcast, Pam. Uh, Thank you for having me. So you've been running the Washington Policy Center Initiative on Agriculture for a few years now. And, and for our listeners, the Washington Policy Center is, is PRI's sister free market think tank in, in Washington state. Um, but you also run a farm and you're a former journalist. So for our listeners, tell us a little more about yourself and, and how you became interested in agriculture policy. So thank you again for having me today. I appreciate the invite. Uh, And as you mentioned, I am the Ag Research Director for Washington Policy Center's Initiative on Ag. I'm also a fourth generation farmer. Uh, My husband and I grow primarily alfalfa and field corn. Alongside my parents, uh, we are a generational farm. And my farming roots go way back throughout Washington State and all over the state, in fact. Uh, My paternal grandparents were orchardists, and they grew... um, primarily tree fruit, uh, particularly apples and pears in the Yakima Valley, which is about two and a half hours away from here. Uh, so I uh, I can also strap on a picking bag and uh, I'm not very good at it, nor am I very fast, but I can do it. Uh, my mom's sister married into a very large cattle ranching family that operates about two hours north of us near the Canadian border. Uh, so I'm familiar with how to work cattle and large livestock as well. I'm also a you know, a 10 year veteran of 4-H and I am the superintendent for our agriculture and horticulture building at our county fair. I also sit on several committees around the state that are ag related. And I'm also the policy and legislative chair for the Washington Cattle Women's Association. So we have a lot of things going on in my household uh, and they're pretty much all ag related. Um, But before coming to Washington Policy Center, uh, in the way back times, uh, I did spend nearly a decade in newsrooms all around the Pacific Northwest. And I did everything from being a news clerk, which is a fancy way of saying I did the really sort of menial chores, like typing up calendars and obituaries, all the way up to running a newsroom as an assistant editor slash copy editor. Um, And while I was working in news, that's really what sparked my interest in communities within communities. Because journalists are not unlike farmers in that they work in a an insular community within a larger community. And I felt like uh, farmers were very similar. And this sort of musing and a desire to have a personal life uh, led me to applying for graduate school. Uh, So I went to Texas A&M University and College Station, where I earned a master's degree in agricultural leadership, education, and communications. Um, Funnily enough, I do have a connection, sort of, to PRI. Uh, My master's thesis was focused on farmers in California, and it's titled Decision Motivations, Factors guiding the choices of agriculturalists in California. In California, I guarantee no one has ever cited my thesis anywhere, but I think that's because it was a little bit ahead of its time. I was interested in looking at reverse engineering consumer motivation surveys and applying them to farmers because we have a lot of data about what motivates consumers. And I wanted to have that same kind of data for what motivates farmers and ranchers. So fast forward, 
I get through graduate school and uh, move back to the Pacific Northwest where no one cares that I went to school at Texas A&M. And so uh, I'm a little bit of a journeyman. I came back, I spent three years working for the East Columbia Basin Irrigation District, which is a federal irrigation project, trying to figure out how to deliver water to deep well irrigators. From there, uh, I went on to sell tractor parts at our local case dealership and then found myself running the communications um, for the Washington Cattle Men's Association before I landed at the Policy Center. Washington and California really do have a lot in common when it comes um, to agriculture and people may not realize it, but it's such a major industry for uh, both our states and ironically, both operate under uh, progressive governments. I remember one of the legislators I worked with back in the day, he represented Fresno County and for whatever reason, they never let him on the ag committee. And he would always say, I represent the number one ag county in America, yet I can't be on the agriculture committee. And, you know, him saying that, I don't think people think of California as being, you know, having the number one ag county um, in America, certainly people who live in urban or suburban areas. Here in California, one big ag issue has come to the forefront in recent days, and that involves pork. It's not only a big issue in California, it's a big issue around the country. We have a law that was approved by voters, Prop 12, which took effect on January 1st. It requires that pigs have 24 square feet of living space in order to be sold in California. I don't think people realize that California consumes 13% of the nation's pork products, but we only have about one-tenth of one percent of um, the nation's breeding sows. Now, Washington state has a huge pork industry, $280 million. How would California's new law affect uh, farmers, not only in Washington, but in the rest of the nation? So when I first read about Prop 12, I was sort of, I was a little bit taken aback, to be honest, because I don't think of uh, pig raising being done particularly in a in a space prohibitive way already. Uh, you know, pig producers, just like all livestock producers, are particularly interested in making sure that their livestock are comfortable. So the, the hallmark of a good livestock producer is one that is ensuring that their animals are comfortable because a comfortable animal is in turn a happy animal. And as I recall, uh, a while back, California Dairy Association had an ad campaign about how happy cows come from California. And the thrust of that campaign was happy cows produce more milk, but the idea is pervasive in all livestock raising. Happy animals are better producers of what it is that they need to produce, whether that is milk or meat or even fiber for that matter, when you're talking about sheep and wool. So what I thought was interesting about Prop 12 in particular is that there's this notion that pigs are raised in you know, crates or in really small confined spaces. And generally speaking, that's just not the case. And the other thing that makes that um, interesting to me is that what California is trying to do is impose their lawmaking on every other producer in the country, um, which I, I think is going to be challenging on an enforcement level. And, uh, you know, bare minimum is going to sort of rob, you know, potentially rob consumers of, of California of pork products that they're used to getting um, quickly, easily, and cost effectively. The other thing that's troubling about any sort of any sort of ag legislation that comes through that looks like this is that it shows really a lack of understanding about animal husbandry and about um, what it means to raise animals, particularly for meat production, because meat production is unique in that you are caring for an animal um, until its last day. And um, it's not something that meat producers take lightly. They care for those animals. And I don't mean that in a sense that they take care of them, they feed them, they give them water. I mean that they care 
care about them as living, breathing things. Uh, they feed them. They bring them into the world. Uh, they, they are concerned when they're ill. So when you have people writing uh, ballot measures like Prop 12, what you have are people who are unfamiliar with livestock production, and they are writing from the perspective of seeing meat consumption as being inherently bad rather than seeing the genuine affection that livestock producers have for their animals from their first day until their last. So let, let's turn to the environment. There have been a, a whole host of new laws passed in both our states to, quote, save the environment. In 2021, California outlawed small off-road engines powered by gasoline, which is a tremendous burden for tens of thousands of small landscaping businesses in the state, many of whom are, are minority entrepreneurs. And Washington State last year attempted to mandate electric power tractors. So will any of this really impact climate change? I will, I will say say that um, the piece I wrote about electric tractors in particular was sort of um, my attempt at being proactive. We'd had a discussion during the 2021 legislative session about banning the sale of all gasoline powered vehicles in the state of Washington. And uh, our governor vetoed that language out of the transportation bill. And it got me thinking about, um, about electric tractors and what happens if that that kind of legislation comes up in ag, particularly because we had a legislator during a meeting say, well, you know, farmers are going to have to start buying electric tractors. We'll subsidize the purchase of these tractors and we'll just give every farmer in Washington $2,500 to buy a tractor. And so my my sort of knee jerk response was no tractor on a commercial level costs $2,500. In fact, you can't buy a tractor tire for $2,500, let alone a whole tractor. My second thought was electric tractors for commercial use are imaginary. They don't exist in real life, but I didn't know that for sure. So I was, I did some research because it's what I do and found that there were a few in development. And for a down payment, you got the promise of an electric tractor someday. The problem with that is that these are electric tractors that max out at approximately 70 horsepower. Now, if you live in the part of Washington where I live, where fields are about 600 acres in some cases, and you're pulling um, implements that weigh in excess of several tons, a 70 horsepower tractor is not pulling that implement anywhere, let alone through 600 acres of sandy loam soil like we have here. Um, and that's, that's where this sort of electric tractor research came from. But I think that it speaks to a larger concern about climate change policy and what is considered, um, quote unquote, green enough to appease people who are um, zealously trying to change uh, the path that we are on um, in terms of climate. Now, I would say that, you know, climate change discussion is for a different day. Um, but I do think that the ag community does need to start to be acknowledged for the things that we do um, out of habit to help the environment and help the land and resources that we need to preserve already. And that includes things like uh, low and no-till agriculture, where we're not turning over the soil every year because we recognize that um, it contributes to changing uh, not just the soil itself, but it also contributes to erosion and, um, you know, it, it's more fuel use and those sorts of things. So if we can cut back on that, that's better for everyone. And then you also have, you know, the carbon sink effect that is also part of low and no-till. Um, regenerative agriculture is having um, a great resurgence around the United States. I think that's something that needs to be looked at more thoroughly. And I do think that, um, you know, a lot of farmers have riparian areas and buffer zones built into their farms that have been there for generations. 
uh, and farms need to be acknowledged for doing those things because they understood even, you know, 50, 60, 100 years ago that those buffers and those areas were necessary for the health of their farms. So, you know, farmers have been observing what constitutes um, sort of green behavior and acknowledging that climates do change for much longer than uh, than I would say our urbanites have acknowledged it. So let's turn to another issue that's hot on Americans' minds, and that's inflation. You know, recently we've seen President Biden taking to the airways blaming so-called big ag for the rising cost of meat and other food items. So um, what's the reality here? Are rising prices really due to anti-competitive behavior in the ag industry, as the president claims, or are there other factors at play here? I think there's a conflation of factors. If, If you're a livestock producer and you've been around livestock for any length of time and you participate in the meat supply chain, you're well aware that the big four, and when I say the big four, I mean Cargill, JBS, Tyson, and Smithfield have been to a certain extent holding livestock producers hostage for a long time. Um, they've, they've figured out a way to sort of control our meat packing markets. I do think, however, that it's more complicated than that, right? You know, we don't have a lot of small meat packing facilities anywhere in the U.S., and we should uh, because small meat packers can do the same job. Uh, and I would argue in some cases they can do it better uh, and certainly potentially faster to give access to local uh, local producers uh, with a quicker turnaround. And I do think that that is the USDA needing to be willing to train state inspectors on a USDA level. But there is also, you know, there's certainly other things going on. You know, we have backups at the port. We have a lack of qualified truckers. Uh, I think we have all been dealing with COVID for a long time. It's been what, you know, 600 days to flatten the two week curve something like that. Uh, And so we have all of these different things that play into the supply chain, and they have all caused this um, sort of eruption of cost increases in food. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. I do think the one real mistake that we can make as a nation is to equate an increase in food prices with an increase in farm income, because those aren't the same. 2021, in fact, is the first year that there was a recorded marked increase in farm income over years previous. And it's still just an estimate. They're not sure if there is actually a real boots on the ground increase in farm income, or if it's just seems that way. And they won't know for sure until the end of of 2022, if that's the case. Well, Pam, here in California, we pay some of the highest capital gains taxes in the country. And and high taxes is why so many people are, are leaving the state. Unfortunately, this year, residents of Washington State took a page from California, and now Washington residents will be paying a a capital gains tax. So those are capital gains tax, especially detrimental to to farmers and ranchers. So it's interesting because the the capital gains tax in Washington State, at least for the farm community, was sort of a bait and switch. Uh, Initially, the ag community had been told that there would not be a capital gains tax assessed for any part of the ag community that we would be exempt from it. And uh, my colleague, Jason Mercier, and I worked on this issue together from different aspects, obviously. And uh, <clears throat> last spring, just as I was headed out to change water on our farm, because we've got about a third of our farm is still real irrigated. So I go out twice a day uh, with a shovel in hand and change siphon tubes uh, by hand. So if you have some old timer ag listeners, they'll know what I'm talking about. Um, And he sent me a comment that had been circulated amongst legislators about why farmers in Washington uh, were going to be subject to the capital gains tax. And it was because farmers had an annual income of $250,000 while working less than half time. Uh, so at that point in springtime, uh, it it takes a fair bit of work to get through the water changing that we have to do 
And it took me 30 acres of water changing um, to try to formulate a response that wasn't borderline enraged um, because there's just not even a kernel of truth to that. I still just can't quite wrap my head around um, where that thought came from. And so what that looks like on the ground for the ag community is particularly in the proceeds of any sales of land. Uh, you know, most farmers look at their farms if they don't have a generational transfer as a means of retirement account because your land is truly your only asset of value. And now uh, those folks are being told that their asset of value is going to be taken from them via capital gains taxes if they sell it. Additionally, some sales of livestock could also fall subject to the capital gains tax. When it was initially worded, the $250,000 limit was not included. And my immediate thought was that any 4-H'er who sold an animal would be subject to the capital gains tax. So you could envision a, an entrepreneurial uh, child selling animals from their herd to other 4-H or FFA participants, and then showing in jackpot shows throughout the course of the year and selling those animals and then selling animals at their county fair or county fairs around the state, potentially being subject to that tax. Uh, and I, I was sort of, it sort of took my breath away a little bit to think about having to talk to a, a teenager about how they made too much money uh, for working hard to earn money for college or a car or what have you. Uh, so the $250,000 limit was imposed, which seems unlikely that you're going to have a, um, a child make that kind of money. But there is still the open door, of course, for um, those other avenues for them to collect funds from farms. So you recently wrote on some of the radical proposals that are coming from animal rights activists in the Western states. We've seen recent ballot initiatives in Colorado and Oregon that would mm -hmm. criminalize hunting, fishing, and even the raising of livestock. In California, we had legislation for a ban on bear hunting that was eventually defeated. Could you discuss your report and some of the the consequences of these radical proposals? Sure. Uh, so I started following the, the Oregon ballot measure, which is IP 13, um, particularly because what we see is often legislation from Oregon finds its way to Washington or vice versa, because demographically speaking, we're, we're very much sort of sister states in that our decision makers are largely both housed in the western part of both of those states in urban areas. And rural communities are often in the eastern part of those states. And that's where a lot of the agricultural base is, is living as well. Um, I also happen to be a big fan of TDS, PDF Honest Farming on uh, both Facebook and Instagram. Uh, it's Derek Josie. If you don't follow him, I fully recommend that you do. Uh, he is a dairy farmer uh, for the Tillamook Co-op and a great resource for all things dairy related. Um, and he happened to be talking about IP13 and that it would effectively end the dairy community in Oregon. And of course, my first thought was um, we need to save Tillamook cheese and ice cream. Uh, <clears throat> but in, I mean, in all seriousness, there's nothing in IP13 that is particularly great. Um, it would, in fact, elevate the artificial insemination of livestock to felony rape of an animal in the state of Oregon. It would also ban all hunting and fishing, the trapping of rodents, the, and the extermination of bugs in your home or business. It would also ban the use of commonly accepted animal husbandry practices. So what that means for uh, non-ag folks is anybody who's ever tuned in to watch Dr. Pohl on Discovery or now on Disney Plus, and uh, Dr. Pohl reaches in and he pulls out a calf and the calf lives and the cow lives and everybody is happy. That stops happening in Oregon if IP13 passes because veterinarians, farmers, ranchers now have to sit, sit back and watch that cow struggle and potentially watch both cow and calf die. Now, if you think about that for a minute, if that were translated into people, we would never allow this kind of legislation to happen because no one can fathom that, that you would sacrifice a life in that kind of way, because it is 
it is cruel and inhumane, but because it's livestock and it's farmers, that somehow means it must be okay. Beyond the cruelty of that, there are there are other things that are involved in this as well. Well, I, and don't get me wrong, my primary occupation is I cannot imagine seeing that kind of suffering and not wanting to intervene. It's just not who any livestock producer is. But when you go into a restaurant or into a grocery store, you expect a certain level of cleanliness. Even a food truck, you expect cleanliness. You expect a lack of bugs and rodents, not just on the premises, but in your food. And when you have something like IP13, all of that goes out the window. Because if you can't exterminate bugs or trap rodents, you've no way to control them in an environment where there's a lot of food prep and food storage. And the last piece of that puzzle is when you look at hunting and fishing. And hunting and fishing isn't for everyone, and I'm not saying it is. But for certain communities, whether they're tribal or otherwise, hunting and fishing are both rites of passage that are deeply important. And IP13 would effectively take those opportunities for rites of passage away from those communities where they matter. So, you know, as a piece of legislation on the whole, when you look at this ballot measure, there's nothing redeeming about it. And yet, if you Google it on the supporter side, how it's being billed is that, you know, supporters just want farmers to be held to the same animal cruelty standards as everyone else. And that's the real problem with it is that it's not about the same standards. It's about ending any kind of animal production in Oregon and ending anything that is deemed unacceptable by the supporters of that particular ballot measure. Pam, let's let's turn to water issues. The drought in the Western U.S. has had a severe consequence for not only the ag industry, but consumers as well. Steve Greenhut, who authored the PRI book, uh, Winning the Water Wars, suggests that governments should be promoting policy of abundance rather than scarcity, which is what Sacramento politicians are pushing. So in Washington state, what is your approach in dealing with the drought? You know, the, the drought uh, here has been interesting. Um, you know, Eastern Washington uh, is effectively a desert region. Um, Western Washington is not. You know, it's it's a very lush, green, rainy part of the state. And so you have this sort of two-thirds, one-third dynamic that makes drought management really challenging. Because if you never venture out of Western Washington, you don't understand that there's this vast dry, but incredibly fertile landscape that uh, opens up as soon as you cross the Cascade Mountain Range. And so uh, we had, in fact, a really deep drought this summer. And, um, you know, folks in Eastern Washington can pretty quickly and easily identify what kind of drought situation we're going to have. Because if we don't have rain after about mid-March, we're going to have a problem. Funnily enough, this year in Western Washington, it became a drought emergency because Western Washington cities that rely on surface water from creeks and rivers for the first time found themselves with a shortage and they were curtailing water use for people's lawns and even things like their domestic use in their homes. Their laundry was relegated to one day a week. Uh, you know, they were asking people to, to run their dishwashers instead of hand washing dishes. And if they didn't have a dishwasher, they were asking them to fill up their sink and wash all of their dishes at once rather than running the faucet to wash dishes. So um, it's interesting because the approach to drought management has been haphazard at best. And what sparked the drought call this year was the dry conditions in Western Washington, despite a month earlier, the wheat growers of our state in the Eastern part of the state calling upon the governor to declare a drought emergency. And it took additional pressure for that to occur. I think as we move forward, we're going to have to figure out a holistic approach to how water functions in this state. Uh, we certainly, we don't have a water war yet, but I do think that one is coming. Um, we have some areas where water allocations to fish and farms and housing developments are at a loggerhead. And so um, our, our very uh, 
messy water management system has not yet addressed drought in a way that makes it manageable long term. And I think that we're going to see that develop over the next I, realistically, it's going to take probably a decade. So it's not here yet, but I think it's coming. So we've spent a lot of time here at PRI discussing how COVID-19 has hurt small businesses, but the agriculture industry has also been very hard hit by the pandemic. Can you discuss some of the issues that the ag industry is still facing due to COVID-19? Ag is interesting in that it still had to continue to function all, all the way through COVID. Um, You know, in fact, when uh, lockdowns first began to occur two years ago, which is still hard for me to wrap my head around, um, one of the very first things I did was put out a blog post reinforcing the need for agriculture and ag-related jobs to be considered essential because you can't stop food from growing. And there is a very finite amount of time in which you can get things planted and you can keep them growing and you can get them harvested and shipped off. And so um, I felt it was really important for our state to recognize that farmers their employees, truckers, and everyone related to agriculture was absolutely essential because you can go without a lot of things, but you can't go without food. Uh, But as we have gone on through the pandemic and tried to find our way through some of the things um, related to people policy, uh, I think it's become very apparent that at least in Washington, and I would say probably across the board, that agriculture is very much a people-driven um, business. And I think a lot of people sort of assume that, you know, you farm, so you sit in a tractor and you're by yourself and it doesn't matter. You don't, you know, you, you're not interacting with a whole lot of people. But if you're in places like Washington, where we have a lot of specialty crops and tree fruit and berries, things that require hand harvesting, and I think similar probably in California, people are next to each other and in very close proximity to one another. And their working conditions are sometimes very hot or uh, cold or windy, or there's a fire. And so you're trying to make people comfortable, but also safe. And that has posed some real challenges for, um, at least I think for every (laughs) regulatory agency. Uh, What we ran into here and are still running into is, you know, Washington is third among recruiting states for H-2A workers. And the first year of COVID, uh, H-2A employers were told that they may have to cut their H-2A housing in half. And they had approximately 10 days notice, uh, which would have caused a humanitarian crisis in our state because H-2A workers are promised a place to live as part of their contract. And when you have 25,000 people showing up expecting somewhere to live and their employer is told with 10 days notice that they have to make uh, half again as much housing uh, appear out of thin air. It gets, um, it gets to be a dire situation. And the reasoning behind it was they felt that bunk beds were too close in proximity for um, the workers and they were concerned about COVID transmission. What they ended up doing as a compromise was assigning H2A workers to a 15 person or less working cohort. So those workers could only be in contact with the 15 or less people in their cohort for the duration of their contact contract uh, throughout the course of, of the year. It posed its own challenges, I think, and we're still seeing them because those rules haven't changed. Um, and I think that's the other part of it is, uh, at least in Washington, what we're seeing is agencies, regulatory a- agencies in ag making what they're calling emergency rules without participating in stakeholder discussion. So farmers and workers are being shut out of the decision-making process in everything from housing to air quality index rules when, as they relate to wildfires for the sake of health and safety. And I'm not trying to minimalize um, health and safety because they are paramount, so much so that Washington has ranked among the top five states in the nation for the last five years in health and safety for farm workers. But 
it needs to be a collaborative effort and process between both agencies, farmers, and employees, not just agencies telling the ag community what to do without getting real world input. Finally, Pam, uh, we call our podcast Next Round because PRI was founded in San Francisco and, and close to wine country. And so we like to ask all of our podcast guests for a, for a wine or a beer or a cocktail recommendation for, for our listeners. So after a hard day's work on your farm or after thinking about agriculture policy, what do you like to drink to unwind? In my younger days, I would have said beer, um, but of late, and I, maybe it's just because I'm old now, uh, I really love ranch water, which is a cocktail. It's sort of like a, a less fancy, less sweet poor man's margarita. Uh, so because I went to Texas A&M, and I feel like if you're an ag person, Texas is still kind of like the motherland for ag people. Uh, a ranch water is a shot of good to te- good tequila. I really like Patrona State personally. Uh, pour it over ice in a tumbler glass, and then you top it off with Topo Chico. Um, purists will tell you to use plain. I prefer Topo Chico lime or grapefruit, and then squeeze a little bit of fresh lime over it, and you're good to go. Wow, I'm going to have to try that. Thank you so much, Pam. Thank you. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Research one That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.